Thank you, Dianda. Thanks, everyone, for coming. So I am going to talk about this evaluation, which is joint work with Lucas Lehner, who's currently still a doctoral student at Oxford. Um, and let me start by giving some kind of big picture context for, for this program and for our evaluation, which is, as you all know, there's been a lot of debate in recent years about various alternatives for existing social safety nets. And uh, there's a number of ideas that have gained a lot of uh, a lot of attention or a lot of uh, traction. And two of those are job guarantee programs in various forms and various forms of uh, basic income or universal basic income or unconditional income. And those are kind of controversial debates and part of the uh, controversies are around the fact that I think that there's a lot of variation in the policy details. What do we actually mean when we talk about the job guarantee? What do we mean when we talk about the basic income? Um, and there's also a lot of variation in the underlying motivating arguments that people make for or against these programs. I'm going to talk today about this one particular evaluation of a job guarantee program in Austria, more specifically in Kalab Neusiedl in Lower Austria, which contains the, the old municipality of Marienthal, where the old study of the Almond of Marienthal took place. And just as a disclaimer, because uh, um, some, some people have claimed things to the contrary, they don't. We don't receive any money for this evaluation. This is independent, and we have a guarantee to publish our findings independently from the implementation partner. I just want to emphasize that at the outset. So, talking of uh, uh, job guarantee programs in particular, there's different um, arguments that have been made for and against. One large set of arguments that the final principle is quite convincing is thinking about unconditional outside options. Right? So, this idea that um, kind, of, kind of the core idea in economics, I guess, that uh, when we are in a bargaining position, whatever relationship, that the strength of our bargaining position depends on our outside option, on the best alternative if we don't reach an agreement. And so if we improve the outside options of people who are generally worse off in society, then that's going to improve the bargaining position, whether it's in employment relationships, in relationships with government bureaucracies, or private or romantic relationships. Um, so that, that might be a strong argument in favor. Another set of arguments that's in particular specific to a job guarantee, there's the first one also applies to basic incomes in some ways, is that um, there are various non-economic benefits of employment, which again is something that, that sociologists and psychologists have emphasized a lot in the tradition of, of for instance, the study on the unemployment of marine tide. And so those benefits include work as a source of meaning, uh, the social interactions that we gain in workplaces uh, and beyond as a consequence, the social respect that comes along with having, uh, having employment of some form. But then there's also some disadvantages that people uh, talk about, potential disadvantages. One might be various forms of spillovers or crowding out, could also be positive spillovers in principle. So this idea maybe we're just um, replacing existing jobs with guaranteed jobs with, without actually improving the situation of, um, on that. There's the kind of one of the most important details, I think, in, in terms of the different programs that are being proposed is how voluntary are they? Right? So you could, um, could think of job guarantee programs that are effectively versions of forced labor when, when it's not voluntary to take on the guaranteed jobs. Um, which is something that uh, sometimes since, since the times of Thatcher and Reagan has been uh, summarized as failure to work there. This idea to make to attach top re uh, work requirements to benefit received, which is a very different kind of program in the end. And there's also the, the risk uh, potentially of creating uh, meaningless activities that are not, not really beneficial for, for participants or society. And so we want to shed some light um, what extent the, these arguments actually apply in this, in this particular program that we evaluate. Let's put this a little bit into the context of the existing literature. Um, and some of these arguments come up a lot when, when we're presenting this. One is that there's been a fair amount of evaluations of various forms of active uh, labor market policies and more specifically of public employment programs. And a number of people have argued that the, these programs are not effective or not successful. Um, uh, but the reason I would argue is that the, the criterion for success that they apply is that people after the public employment program actually find a job in the regular labor market, right? So kind of the, the target outcome for pretty much all of these existing evaluations is whether people find a regular job. The 
uh, is emphatically not what the goal of the program we're evaluating here is, and it's not the object of our evaluation. Instead, we are primarily interested in the impact on participant welfare, right? So, in particular, this is going to be a, a program for people who are long-term unemployed and who are pretty unlikely of finding a regular job um, with or without the program. And so, our goal is not to go to find whether they, they get a job in the regular labor market afterwards. On the other hand, and this is again more of a literature that's, that's more outside economics, although it's been also discussed a little bit within economics, there's been a lot of correlation evidence on, on the relationship of employment to, to subjective well-being and health, by right? so various various measures of physical well-being, of mental health, and so on. And so extensive correlational evidence, but actually uh, surprisingly little causal evidence, right? So surprisingly little evidence, what's the causal effect of uh, finding employment or a job um, on, on the well-being of participants. And so this is something that we, again, want to shed some light on. And lastly, there's been a, there are some predecessors of job guarantee programs, but actually quite limited in, in which country context, at least. So maybe the, the most well-known job guarantee program is one in India that has been around for many years in different forms. Which is a program very simple, which has been credited of preventing famines in India since independence. Basically, the way these programs work is that, especially in crisis situations, the government um, guarantees low, low paid employment in, in public construction projects, road construction, and so on, which has helped to, to avoid like acute crisis. But it's again a very different context and type of program from what we're studying in here. So arguably, this is kind of one of the first uh, first sources of evidence in job guarantee programs in the rich country context. And of course, um, and I will talk more about this at the very end of my talk. Uh, the location where this job guarantee program is taking place is the same location that the the Arbeitslosen from Marine Thai uh, was originally studied, which is a, a pretty Really impressive um, work of research. It has been very influential, including in the Anglo Saxon world, actually. And um, I mean, all the, all the authors of this original study, um, Yahoo Doshi was first imprisoned on the, on the Dolphos and then had to flee from the Nazis. Um, so, so they all ended up in uh, the US. Yahoo ended up being a professor in England. And has had a fair amount of influence on, on the sociology of work there. And one one of the things that kind of came out of this study and the subsequent work is um, what what in this literature is called the latent and manifest benefits of work. And so they put in particular these six categories under that, and we are going to very much focus on these categories too in our in our study. And so these categories are collective pur uh, purpose, so the work as a source of meaning social inclusion and interactions at work, um, work as a source of status, uh, as, uh, as opposed to the social stigma that might go along with being unemployed, work as a source of activity or activation, so kind of increasing the, the amount of, of energy and involvement in life, even outside the workplace, the impact of work on time structure and kind of the disintegration of time that might go along with unemployment, and then, of course, the, the more economic aspect of financial strain and poverty that uh, goes along with unemployment. And so, these are all aspects that were, were kind of um, extracted, if you want, from, from the observations in the original Zavintal study. And in a way, you can think of what we're doing here in Samsung's mirror image, we're in the same place like 100 years later. Um, we kind of do the opposite, right? So back then, everybody lost their, their job in this town because it was a factory town, a factory shut down, in a great depression. And literally everybody was unemployed. And now we started this program there. Sorry. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, this program which gave everybody a job and we kind of studying in the, in the sense the reverse effect, what happens if everybody gets jobs. All right, so so much for the big picture context. Now, here's the plan for the rest of my talk. I'm going to first uh, tell you a bit more about the actual program, which was launched by the AMS Lido Österreich. Uh, then I'm going to spend some time on the study design, and uh, I will be fairly, fairly detailed on that. So it's going to be the most technical aspect of, of the presentation, but I think there's a number of interesting things to discuss there. 
is giving an explanation of what I'm interested in. And then I will tell you about the findings. All right, so what's the program? The Marine Pilot Job Guarantee uh, Pilot. This was uh, this started in October 2020 in Kavatoisidl. And which again is a municipality in Lower Austria, uh, which which contains Nabalintal as one, one of the parts of the current municipality. Um, and the eligible population here are all long-term unemployed residents of Common Neusiedl. But for the purpose of this study, uh, long-term unemployment is defined as at least nine months of unemployment at, at baseline, uh, which is less stringent than the common definition of 12 months. Um, and the way it works actually is that people who, who reach the threshold later, um, so after the start of the program, they're also eligible uh, to participate in the job guarantee, but they are not part of our experimental sample, which uh, which we needed to do with the sign. So we still reason why you choose Marienthal except for for this being a very famous study 90 years ago, or is there um, so, I mean, that, that choice, I guess, was, was made by the Amens uh, yeah. Okay. I think for several reasons. One is kind of the symbolic uh, nature of, of being in the same place, but also it's kind of, it was kind of the right size given their budget, uh, right? So the, uh, the amount of money they, they had was um, roughly the right one for, for starting this program for everybody in this municipality. And they did want to do this in a concentrated manner where it's everybody gets it. Uh, so yeah, it was actually the same thing is my understanding. And uh, kind of at the start of the program, there's kind of a preparation phase of, of eight weeks, which is uh, uh, kind of involves various things. So it's kind of not a classic training program, but it involves caseworkers who are working with uh, with the unemployed to basically try and figure out um, what kind of job would work for them. And come up with, with a job that that makes sense given given whatever constraints they have and what might be needed in the municipality, right? And so the constraints are important because there's I mean, people people who are long term unemployed usually have various problems in their life. Many of them have health problems and so on, and so it doesn't make sense to offer them a job which they couldn't do given their health problems or, or other constraints. And so they make new reports. They don't have their care responsibilities, like having to take care of young children and so on. And so they made sure that the, the job offerings um, were consistent with these constraints. And based on that, individually tailored job openings were created. There, there were various routes for these jobs. So the largest category are jobs in the newly founded social enterprise. So that was um, founded for, um, for this program and run by the, by the municipality. And in the context of this social enterprise, they provide various services in the municipality, including things like childcare, gardening, renovation, carpentry. There are people who go shopping with the elderly in the town and various other things. Um, a subset of those, and that was something they tried to encourage, was um, to, to start projects that the participants conceived of themselves. Right, so there, one example was to participants creating a bike path that connected various old factories in the region. And creating documentation for that and so on. Another one was somebody who who um, wanted to update the, the museum in the municipality and digitize uh, lots of old family photos and created an online archive. It's actually kind of interesting to look at. Um, so there are like thousands of thousands of old family photos going back to the 60s that are available now. This database um, showing a lot how how town life developed over the years. Um, and then there's a subset of them who also get subsidized jobs in the regular labor market, which basically meant that, that the IMS would pay, pay wages for the first year and then not pay subsidies afterwards. But there was kind of an expectation that the company would, uh, the private company would keep on the, the unemployed afterwards without any strong sanctions attached to it. But it's kind of the implicit sanction of the IMS not sending them other unemployed people for, for job openings they might have if they don't keep the... Was there any number of participants in these categories by, say, previous duration of the requirement? So let's say that very often they get jobs in 
Well, not in terms of the rules of the program, but de facto, that's presumably what happened, right? So, um, yeah, I mean that the people who got the subsidized jobs tended to be the ones that had a higher chance, higher job. Yeah, let me, so, so if, for example, if they do gardening. Why wouldn't they be able to go into a regular firm where they're offer garden people? Is, is, is there something special besides? Uh... I mean, there's, right, and that's actually something where I was grateful for a lot of the work that the journalists did around this. I mean, if you read the life stories of the people involved, like you know, there's so many different stories that they yeah. have, right? You know, we tend to think of unemployment as kind of this homogenous category, maybe, but really it's, uh, at, all kinds of family histories, uh, um, disabilities, histories of abuse, um, all kinds of things that, that prevent people from being able to keep a regular job. So my, my question is, what's the difference between the social enterprise and the normal enterprise? I mean, yeah, are there, what, what are the different, are there, what are the difference in the rules of, I don't know, and they choose the, the hours work or whatever, what is the... Yeah, I mean, the, 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 exactly, the hours work that were, I mean, they were negotiated and discussed like, based on constraints because I have some of them are like part time employment in the social enterprise. Um, the way the show social enterprise works is they, they have a few caseworkers, but the caseworkers, they're actually not social workers, they're just people who, I don't know how best to, to describe that, but they're the people who have like some experience in gardening or carpentry or something like that and just um, kind of uh, work as in some work overseers who collaborate with the participants. Um, right, in case you were wondering, uh, here is Kamat Neusiedl, just out of Vienna to the southeast. Um, and again, just to, to emphasize these points, and this, this was something that was very important to us, and uh, we something we discussed before, before starting the evaluation. Um, we were insistent that participation should be voluntary, right, where again, if, uh, in a way, it's like a done a bit of an argument, but if you increase the option side of people, you make them better off. If you force people to do something that they were not forced to do before, generally you're going to make them worse off. And so if you want to improve people's welfare, you have to make this voluntary. Um, so there's no sanctions uh, involved for, for each of your job offer. That being said, pretty much everybody um, accepted a job offer. Right? So this program was nice enough in some sense that uh, I mean, and that's kind of a striking finding because it's a simple finding, but yeah, people do want to work, including these long term unemployed. Um, yeah, there are some uh, minor note here. The, for legal reasons, they had to make the, the training part uh, required, but the IMS is not allowed to do things unconditionally by law, but they could make it so that the, the job itself was not required. Um, second, the Pays the collective contraction, the collectively bargained wage, which amounts to roughly 1500 euro per month for full time employment and a bit less for, for the part time employees. And lastly, there was a lot of um, emphasis of trying to make the employment meaningful, right? So it's not supposed to be occupational therapy type uh, situation. It's supposed to be work that actually has a purpose in the community, but is also perceived as meaningful by the participants. Um, who are the participants that already emphasized kind of this is a very heterogeneous population, right? Despite this being the one small town in the world, Austria of it. Um, and these being people who are selected on being locked from unemployed in the town. So uh, about 40% are women, roughly half of them are over 50, the other half under 50, about a third have some migration background, about half have more than three schools, so education more than minimum. About a third is some form of recognized disability or, or medical constraint. Uh, but uh, if you look over the last 10 years, um, on average, about they have been unemployed for about 50% of these last 10 years. So that's a lot, right? So the, the cutoff is nine months, but that doesn't mean that it's the only unemployment spend. It's like most of them have been in and out of employment and um, have been more recently employed. Um, Right. So that's the program. Now, let me go to the study design. And then it's going to get a little bit more technical, but I think it's maybe also what made, uh, the, the parts that make the study very interesting. 
And so there are a number of evaluation challenges that we're facing here uh, that we've tried to address in different ways. The first one is that we have a fairly small sample size, um, although it's a fairly kind of large intervention or, or massive intervention in comparison. But the baseline sample of program participants that we look at is only 64 people, and then we put additional control groups outside. And so we have to make sure to kind of get our standard levels down in order to get meaningful results. And so one way you can do that, and that's something we worked on a fair bit, is uh, we're using pairwise randomization. But the idea is basically you um, not just randomly assign participants to the freedom control. Instead, what we are doing is uh, among the sample of uh, possible participants, match them on a rich set of baseline covariates to find people who look very similar to each other and then randomly assign them to different waves within the pair. And what it does is it brings down the standard errors a lot. We get a lot more precise estimates for the same size. Excuse me, you have to turn off. I couldn't hear uh, the control group. Where is this coming from? The control group. Sorry, can you say that again? Where is the control group coming from? Um, so, so I'll tell you in a second. Um, there are multiple control groups. Um, one control group is uh, we are doing staggered rollout, right? So uh, different people start the program at different points in time, and so we can uh, compare people who started already and those who didn't. Um, uh, yes, and so what it also allows us is uh, we can think about anticipation effects, right? So when you, when you start a program like this, quite often be worried that um, even before um, you start the program, you already know you're going to have the program in the future and that might in impact you in various ways. One way it might impact you, which kind of, I don't know, classical economics would suggest this, um, you, have some kind of, you anticipate future income going up and you might start consuming more now and that. Uh, that might kind of reduce your, your estimated treatment effect from the rolled out. Or you might have the opposite in some sense. You anticipate getting a job in the future anyway, and so you could reduce your search effort for a regular job now. Let's just go the opposite direction. Um, and so in order to get at that, what we're doing is we're doing this one point contrast in as you asked, um, between later participants and earlier participants. But then we are also comparing the participants to a participant, similar individuals, control towns. So I'll tell you more about that. The people that know each other, they know each other. The participants do, yeah. Yeah, so, so if they're staggered, so if, if, if I get the job now, I know what's going on. I can tell my neighbor, okay, so in, in two months, you're getting this. Yeah, and they, they all need yeah. it. Right? So it's very public that the program is starting. Um, the control towns, I mean, they, they're not really impacted, right? So I'll tell you more about that. Which also gets me to the, the third point here, which is you might be worried about this equilibrium effect or spinovers, right? which is something people often mention, is this idea that, for instance, there might be crowd out, um, right? You give some people jobs, but these jobs would have been done anyway by somebody else without the program. And um, so the net effect on empl uh, employment or economic well-being would be smaller than the individual effects that you get from participation. Or you might have positive spillovers, right? So maybe you're stimulating the local economy and whether it's a demand effect or something else. Um, there might be positive impacts on your neighbors if you get a job. Um, and so to get at that, we want to estimate the effects not just at the individual level, but also at the municipality level. And to do that, we are um, doing this cross-location comparisons, and in particular, we, we design the synthetic control for the municipality, and I will explain more what it means in a minute. Um, Get kind of like a uh, control for chronic noise, you know, to, to see how uh, what would have happened in the absence of the program at the level of the municipality, including to people who are not actually eligible to participate. Okay. Do you think these jobs are permanent jobs? Um, in the program, they are, well, it's a bit unclear at this point, but uh, they're definitely for three years. What's happening afterwards, we don't know yet. It's part of the current political debate. Uh, so it's been running for, for a bit more than two years now, and see what happens afterwards. Um, yeah, so, so we have these three contrasts that the study is based on. We have this pairwise matching and staggered rollout. We have the synthetic control comparison at the municipality level, and then we have this individual level comparison to individual, similar individuals and control municipalities. 
And so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the digital literature uh, after these approaches are out. Um, so the pair is matching, right? So we have a bunch of baseline covariates as of September 2020 for each of the long-term unemployed in covered noise needle. This includes things like gender, age, migration, background, education, disability. So like the, the, the variables I showed you before in the picture. And also includes the, the level of benefits, uh, which is basically a measure of uh, previous income. And also includes the, the number of days unemployed in the last 10 years. Based on these variables, we can then calculate the distance between um, any pair of individuals. It's called the Mahalanobis distance, where basically we just normalize it by, by the variance. Right, so we can just see how different the different people. And then we can find, kind of take all the all the unemployed people and form pairs in a way that the sum of distances between each pair, because you need pair, it is as small as possible. But right, so basically, again, what it's doing is we're, we're for, forming sets of twins, if you want, that's just sets of people who are as similar as possible to each other. And then within each pair, we do a random assignment where one of the uh, people in the pair starts early, uh, one starts late. And what early and late means here is the, uh, the first wave starts in December 2020, their drops, the second wave in April 2021. From the perspective of the study, it would have been nice to have more of a gap here, but this was kind of a constraint that we had. Um, what about the corona, so the corona time? Was there a... All of it is during COVID. Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about that later. Yeah, that is what it is. Um, yeah, but that it works to affect uh, some of yeah. the behavior. It would, and so I think that's where, and then again, I'll talk about it in a minute, but. Uh, but the, these cross location comparisons are going to help us at least uh, tease part of that out. Because obviously the, the control rooms these are equally affected by COVID. So we can at least see the difference um, how, how common noise is differently affected. Um, right, so, so did the campus matching work? Here you see the summary table. Um, as you can see, we, we managed to make the two waves very similar to each other. We have the exact same share of men in both waves, almost the exact same average age, the exact same share of migration background, education, um, almost the same in terms of health condition, whether it's some measure of partial disability that's recognized by the IMS, um, same benefit levels. The one difference that, that shows up here a little bit is slightly different the number of previous unemployment days. That's a variable that had a lot of variance. But if you look at um, uh, the p-values, right? So um, if, if it's just a pure randomization, we would expect these p-values to be uniformly distributed between two and one. Given that they're all much larger than that, it basically shows you that we managed to make the two waves very similar to each other, which is exactly what helps us bring the standard errors down when we do the standard RCT, standard randomized experiment. So that's the, the pair randomization. Then the synthetic control, uh, right? So that's a way of of, um, of finding something to, that we can compare the entire municipality to. Uh, so here we had a lot of data sources that you could draw on. So we use data from the AKS data warehouse, patient career monitoring, and from Statistic Austria. And um, we've got a, whole, a large set of variables for each of these municipalities that, that seem relevant here. We picked the 5% the of municipalities in Lower Austria that are closest to common noise, again, in terms of the spiral Lobis distance, normalized the variance. And then among those, we formed this so called synthetic control. And what's synthetic control? It's basically a way of, of coming up with a fictitious common noise based on these other municipalities where you take like a weighted average of other municipalities that looks exactly like common noise does. And it looks exactly in the sense of having the same covariate values and the same historical trajectory of unemployment over the last 10 years. And so something yeah, I also want to emphasize here is both the pairwise randomization and the synthetic control are pre registered right? So we publicly committed to our comparison groups, both at the individual level and the municipality level before the program even started. So kind of tying our hands, there's no way to cherry pick anything here in order to 
kind of get the, the results you might want, um, which is more common for randomized experiments here. I think it's kind of nice that we were able to use this control, which more often is used for kind of retrospective historical studies. Not really pre register. And so um, these are the municipalities and the municipality control. Um, on the left hand side, you see the weight, right? So basically, we form a weighted average of whatever is happening this is in this town. So it's like 50% um, is Ibrahim Storf, then 20% uh, is Thailand, 40% is Kusbach, and so on. Um, and we form a weighted average of these municipalities to get like our synthetic kind of noisy building. And so we used a lot of variables here. I'll show you just what happens with unemployment, right? So this is the unemployment trajectory over the last 10 years in covered noise which, which is the red line, uh, in the synthetic control, which is the gray line. So which essentially shows you that we are very able to find the kind of a control that looks very similar in the past. And the map, so. Uh, in, in, in red, it's our treated town. Then we have in orange the, the municipalities that got a larger weight. That's so Ibrechsdorf, uh, Brusburg, and Ceylon. And then the blue ones are quite large, that got a somewhat smaller weight. So the majority of them are kind of small towns in the vicinity of Vienna. And then we have a third approach. Uh, the third approach is uh, the individual level. So we call the first one is individual level. That's the second rollout. The second one is the level of the town. And the third one is again at the level of individuals. But now we're comparing to individuals in this static control towns. And uh, we're comparing in particular to the long term employed. Um, so we, since we were doing kind of our own surveys of uh, participants and controlling individuals, we had to restrict ourselves to for the smaller number of towns, we, we picked it. The towns with the largest weight in synthetic control, uh, which covers a lot of it. And uh, we're selecting these based on the same criteria as participants, which is um, nine months of unemployment as of September 2020. And then we compare them, we also choose for, for all the basic covariance that we have for each of them. Um, so, by Kind of why do we go through all these hoops of the, all these different comparisons? But the idea is that it allows us to separate out these different effects that I mentioned, right? So we, we have the direct effects. What's the effect on you of being actually currently in the program? But then we also have these anticipation effects. What's the effect of being in the program in the future? Like whether it's say to through permanent income or through the effects on your search or something else. And we have the spillover effects potentially. Um, based on the, the other number, the, the number of other people in the town who are uh, currently eligible for the program. And so we can summarize that. Obviously, it's my own, uh, own side of math, but I think this is actually useful to, to walk through this. Uh, we can summarize in this way where, where we can see your outcome, whatever the outcome is that we're looking at, is a function of these three things. So it's a function of whether you're currently in treatment. It's a function of whether we can expect to be in the program in the future, and it's a function of the share of long term unemployed or current eligible. But then the outcome might also depend on all kinds of other things that we don't observe, but which we sometimes in the sense of here. And then one more piece of notation uh, allies whether you're basically in the eligible group, right? whether you're uh, nine months unemployed. So you observe this for example, the person's or what they ask in this term? We do not have that in our data. No. But so, um, anyway, this this table summarizes our entire study. Um, this is a bit of notation here, but let me go through it because again, it's, it allows us to disentangle these different effects. Right? And this is where kind of really doing these different contrasts is is really coming in helpful, uh, to be helpful. Right, so the, the most basic comparison is between group one and group two. Right, the, the people who start the, the job currently early in the summer 2020 versus those who start in April uh, the following year. Um, and here we do the comparison in February 2020, right? So after the first one, being in the program for a couple of months uh, before the second one will start. 
we can't do it later because at the later point, the, everybody is in the employment program, and so we don't have the experimental comparison anymore. And so, in the notation I introduced on the last slide, right, the group one, the, the ones who start early, they are treated. We can expect to be treated in the future. So that's the first one and the second one. And half of the people in the municipality are eligible for the program at the time. So that's the one half, right? We have to split over exams. There is the ones, the second wave or the second group, they are not treated. So that's the zero, but they, they, are, they can also expect to be treated in the future. Half, half, half their peers are in, in the program already. And here, since we're looking at the eligible population, we're conditioning on everything. So it's an average for the, for the ones who are not term unemployed baseline. And so what this contrast then gives us is what we can call the average time ranking for group three. Right, so holding constant anticipation effect, holding constants below where it affects what is the effect of being in the program versus not. On the other hand, we can at the same time um, compare to a different comparison, uh, looking at the individuals in control towns. Right, so the control town individuals, they are not treated. They are not eligible to be treated in the future, and none of the peers are treated. Right, so that's the zero, zero, zero here. Um, and if we compare them to our group two, the ones who are who are uh, not treated yet but will be in the future, um, at least if we assume that spillover effects don't matter here, but this, this allows us to get the next question. Small scope, zero control. Um, not in the initial waves. Um, it's a bit of an issue in the later waves, right? So right now we're just trying to chase everybody down. Um, we're doing the best we can, but yeah. Initially, it was not a not. Um, we actually got most of them. Part of the reason being that the IMS helped us to get at them, or to get a call from to them. And so since they were unemployed at the, uh, at the time of initial waves, we could reach them. In the meantime, a bunch of them might have moved or many found jobs or is, uh, otherwise not be in contact with the IMS anymore, so it's getting a little bit harder. Um, all right, so that's, that's kind of the initial comparison, right, at, at the time when we have the experimental contrast. Uh, the, the we have this group one, group two, and control town. Then after April 2021, 20, uh, um, we can still compare both, both of the, these groups to the control town individuals, but we don't have the experimental contrast anymore. And now, right, so now both group one and two are treated. Uh, they can anticipate to be treated in the future, and all their peers are treated. Control town, still none of these things. And so we can think of this as the average total effect on the treatment, right? So total effect includes the direct effect, the anticipation effect, and the spillover effect. Um, and you can look at the municipality level at impacts on short-term unemployment and total unemployment, right? So that's what the satellite control does. Um, short-term unemployed, since they're not eligible for the program, right? It's really only the spillover effects better for them. So we can think of this as average spillover effects on the untreated. And lastly, the effect on total unemployment you can think of as the average total effect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is kind of why by having these different contrasts and these different kind of study approaches really helps us to tease apart the different. So why? Uh, so Gramat Noise Seidel is uh, a neighboring town, right? But Gramat Noise is the treated. Uh, it's a little bit confusing. Okay. Marienthal is a part of Klamath Noise. I see. Okay. Right. It's just for the historical reason that the, the name was chosen to be Marienthal. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, it's a Klamath Noise, not in red, it's the treated town. The control towns are all the others. The biggest rates are the orange ones. So the orange ones are the really survey of, of long term unemployed people. Okay, and then we have this the third comparison, right? The, the individual level. Oh, sorry. Uh, we yeah, so that that was kind of on the identification of the different effects. Uh, last uh, last slide of the methods. Uh, how do we do inference? Uh, most of it is based on so called randomization inference. So the idea of randomization inference is you can assume the null hypothesis that the treatment has no effect on various outcomes that we might be interested in. 
And this is a nice null hypothesis uh, to, to inference on because basically under this null hypothesis, we know what would have been the outcomes for any different treatment assignment, maybe it would have been the same outcome. Right? And so what this then allows us to do is basically rerun our treatment assignment algorithm, but right? rerun the pairwise randomization, create a new treatment assignment, and calculate the treatment effect for this kind of new treatment assignment. And if we do that many times, we get a distribution of estimated effects, and we can compare the actual effect to this distribution. And the share of the, the this, this, this distribution that's bigger than the estimated effect of the p value. Basically, if the p value is small, you reject the null hypothesis. So randomization inference is nice because we essentially need zero assumptions, right? This this holds exactly in finite samples. Um, condition everything, all the randomness comes from the actual randomness you're generating in the treatment assignment. Um, so there's no kind of question marks about how to calculate standard errors or whatever. Um, this is exactly the first five examples. Now for the synthetic control, we can't really do uh, randomization inference literally because the town is not chosen randomly. Um, however, and that's kind of something that's become standard, we can do something that's at least formally analogous to randomization inference or permutation inference. But essentially what we're doing is we have these 26 municipalities that are most similar to Kermit Neusel. For each of them, we can pretend they are the treated municipality, run the synthetic control approach for them, get a set of controls for them, calculate a treatment effect for them, um, and do that kind of 26 times. And that gives us again like a distribution of effects, and we can compare the estimated uh, synthetic control effect for Kermit Neusel to this distribution. And again, if you're an outlier relative to this distribution, then there's an actual effect. So it's it's formally completely the same as randomization inference, but not quite just the same um, same strong amplification. Stop here before I jump into the findings. See if there are any questions. Good. Okay. So. The next few slides, there's going to be a lot of pictures with a lot of estimates, um, but that maybe before I jump into them, let me give you kind of a high level summary of, of the empirical findings. Um, starting with the individual level experimental comparison, where we find a lot of strong positive impacts of program participation on their on participants' economic and non economic well being. Um, we do not define effects, and that's kind of as you would expect on. Uh, the preferences, right? So things like risk and time preferences, which literature which suggests are more like personality traits that are pretty invariant over time. We also do not affect uh, find effects of physical health, which also would be kind of surprising to physical health it, um, changed a lot in a short time period. In your introduction, you mentioned that you measure economic well being, but then you were was criticizing that uh, the outcome of the other studies, which were just looking at the employment prospects and so on. But now you're doing basically as a. So, by economic well being, I mean things like um, employment and income and um, income yeah. security. Well, this is what, what the other studies. No, so, no, no, so that here the employment that becomes the employment in the program, right? It's not market employment afterwards. The other studies look at there's the program. But then the program ends, and then you ask to define the regular job in the regular labor market. Yeah, but but if I'm, I'm eligible for the program, I have a job anyhow. Yeah. So so. But like but like the the existing studies, they they look at if there's some temporary public employment program. The program ends. Do people have a regular job afterwards? Okay, That's but but here, if I'm in the program, I get no employment, I get no income, and I have some security because it lasts for yeah. years. So that part is not. That part is not very surprising. It's still positive, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the part of it that is a bit surprising is that everybody accepted the job, right? Which okay, but well, would not necessarily have been my prior. Um, okay. Sure. So, I mean, so that, I but fair enough. You're not surprised by that. The, the the second part I want to emphasize more though the the work related benefits, uh, which again is something that uh, I mean, in a way, sociologists and psychologists might not be as surprised by. It's not really part of of starting that econ discussion so much. And it's exactly the variables that Yahoo and her co-authors have emphasized, um, which again show up in our, our study, which, which again we didn't necessarily expect beforehand as being the ones where we see the strongest effects of, of actually finding employment. 
So it's really kind of, in some ways, the mirror image of, of what happens in the old study. Um, at the municipality level, we find large reduction of long-term unemployment. Again, not very surprising. Um, then there was question of spillovers. The spillovers is a little bit ambiguous. You know? So there, the point estimate is that we find a small increase of short-term unemployment. Um, the, on aggregate, there is a clear and strong reduction of unemployment. It's almost as large as the reduction in long-term unemployment. This one here is a bit of an issue with the precision. Right? So um, it's hard to say if there's something real or if it's a statistical fluke. Um, yeah, that is what it is, I suppose. Um, and then we have this individual level comparison across towns, which also allows us to get at this longer term effects. We, we find very similar effects to the to the direct experimental comparison, and we find some some evidence positive anticipation effects on non variable self status and self inclusion. How did you measure the economic outcomes and how frequently? Uh, you measure them? Uh, so I'll give you a long list. Uh, we, we measured them annually. We, we were doing this service every February since program start. So right now we're doing the third wave. I'm going to show you, show you here the first two waves. Um, so we have admin data on, on the folks and we have additional events. This long survey that we did this then. Um, all right. The economic outcomes, the kind of unsurprising one if you want. Um, but here is next mention. So the way I'm going to show you a lot of pictures like this um, to make things comparable and putting them in the same picture, everything's normalized. What I mean by that is every every variable that I'm going to show you, it's going to range from zero to one. So you can this is when the variable can tell you the exact definitions, but uh, for now it's all normalized zero to one, and this sign is chosen so that more is better. So in particular, a variable like unemployment, the sign is flipped. Um, that's why I have a little minus here. Um, make sure it's like better is always to the right hand side here. And so um, the treated group, if you want, group one, they are the ones who started the job currently early. The untreated group, maybe uh, about the group two, who start job currently later, they might be great problems. Everything is extremely significant here, according to the randomization trends, in the sense that pretty much all the few values are basically zero. Um, Effects. Here is non-economic effects in the experimental comparison. So again, we looked at a lot of variables. I'll show you the p-values in the next slide. Um, some artifacts here. Um, so these are sort. Uh, this picture is sorted based on the p-values in the next slide. Um, you find the strong, strong positive effects for the variables that are on the top here. So the latent and manifest benefits are disaggregated further. So and those are mostly aggregate businesses that correspond to a number of survey questions. Um, latent manifest benefits is, are the ones that go back to Yahoo's work, and they are the ones where you find the strongest effect actually. Um, so the, that there's an index that contains the six categories that I was mentioning at the beginning that came out of the original trial study. Um, yeah. So in terms of like subjective COVID stress, subjective well-being and change and social inclusion, um, we also find a fair amount of positive effects. Everything down here, not so much. In particular, things like um, like preferences, right? Where we did just again in the index of the large number of variables, we find no movement, which is kind of what we would hope. Um, here's the corresponding p-values, right? So the ones at the top are the ones where we actually do have. Uh, strong statistically significant effects. And you can, so here, this one is disaggregating this indices a bit more. Can you Hi, I don't think it works. It's okay. Like this, okay. Um, the unemployment and the employment variable. Yeah. So we are comparing um, group one and group two. Yeah. So the group we're comparing group one who is in co 
currently um, enrolled in the program. Yeah. Uh, but is there anyone who dropped off? Hmm? Is there anyone who dropped out of the program? There, there's there's a few cases, right? So uh, uh, like one person ended up in prison, one of a uh, few people were in hospital. Um, so there's there's some cases like that. Um, what these verbs are is um, share of days employed since start of the program, with the exact definition. Um, and so some of them didn't start right away, so that's quite stressing all the way to one. Um, Answers. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm just a bit, um, because if you're comparing the people that are involved in the program, then their employment for all of them is one. And if you're comparing them to. Well, so that was eligible for the program, right? So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Again, which includes people who are in prison or in hospital or uh, uh, wanting to migrate it out. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. So if you increase it later, if you go to the, you can look up later before the definitions of all these variables exactly in the paper. You want to read them now, right? But like unemployment share based not employed since October 1, 2020, for instance. The online dependency get all our survey questions. Um, all right. Yeah, here, this is where I wanted to go next. So I said, like, the, the variables uh, I showed you for the, for the non-economic benefits, those are all aggregates. And here I'm, like, showing you the underlying variables for, for two of those, the, namely the LAMP index, the latent and manifest benefits. That's the one going back to Yahoo, um, which I guess uh, a number of uh, sociologists have been using for correlational studies in recent years. And here, are like the different elements of of the preference um, index, and so basically, as uh, what you can see here, and people should correspond to this on all these components of of the LAMP index, we find these positive effects, such as things like financial strain, social status, activities, social interactions, collective purpose, and time structure. So the six dimensions that the the green color of those of those study emphasized. On the other hand, on all the preferences, it's it's pretty much nothing if you, if you look at a few values of this, um, which we, we can think of as a kind of placebo or validation check that this comparison actually makes sense and the various moves that we think should move. But just in, in the opinion of that one thing that's quite surprising. One thing that strikes me as surprising when I think about this comparison to the classical marine tile study, I mean, it was there that the whole town basically was unemployed. Yeah. So you would think that unemployment, in a sense, is socially less painful because yeah. everyone share everyone shares this experience. And uh, still, um, these measures they used in that time seem to be the ones who are very important. Yeah. But when you look at the last slide, uh, there is no like social network effect of being. Yeah. Um, so right. Do you have any? the number of people I've actually interacted with that particular day? Uh, so these variables, I mean, they're, they're not literally the variables of the original study, right? So the original study was like a qualitative multimodal study. Uh, okay. They crafted a lot of different things and they came up with like, these ideal types of reactions to unemployment and in particular with these dimensions, um, which for them was kind of a productive exercise you want. And then more modern sociologists have taken these ideas and turned them into survey questions. And the survey question are the ones that we are using. All right. So that was for the experimental comparison on the individual level. This is kind of a summary of synthetic control comparison. Right. So these are three pictures, the, each, each of them for the same time frame. The left one showing the unemployment uh, rate over time, the second one, the long term unemployment rate, and the third term, the, the third one, the short term unemployment rate. Sum up for that one. Um, and if you recall, we constructed the synthetic control to, to be similar to ground noise space. What we mean as similar is the, the annual unemployment rates over the last 10 years. So the variables shown here are actually not what were targeted by the construction. Nonetheless, you see, like in the in the pre-period before the program starts, which is the vertical line. Uh, sorry, which is, which is, the, which is the, the gray bar here. Um, 
pretty much exactly it's exactly line up. So kind of the if you want to design a successful in the sense that it actually mirrors what's going on kind of noisy loop. Now we have of course the, this big issue that you couldn't really do anything about which is COVID started before the program started. Um, however again this is affecting both kind of noisy and the controls. So in that sense if there were similar effects they should difference out if you take a if you do a comparison. Um, and so you look at long term unemployment, right? Again, the long term unemployed are the ones who are eligible. You might wonder why doesn't it go all the way down to zero, given that everybody took off the jobs? The reason is kind of just the data reason that, again, we couldn't do much about, which is that the eligibility is defined at the municipality level, behind the, the data are defined at the zip code level, at the post like sign. Uh, in this case, the, the zip code is a larger geographical unit than. Then the municipality, which meant that essentially about 60% of the people in the in the zip code are also in the municipality and therefore in the right? So that's that roughly corresponds to the 60% reduction that we see here in long-term unemployment rates. Um, uh, always now understand historically. Uh, so you have this town come up no seater. Yep. Then you come in with this program, you offer the people jobs. And this, of course, that unemployment must go down. I mean, yeah. I see some kind of tautological result. I mean, sure, yeah, up, up to well, two parts are not right. So, uh, the first one is the fact that people actually take up these jobs. Which yeah, is, but, but okay, it, it, I mean, it's, it sounds very attractive. Do uh, you can choose or you have yeah. a lot of social? I mean, I agree, but I, I, I choose your job. So I'm not sure would have, uh, I or many people would have necessarily thought it beforehand. So they participated. Uh, you know, uh, what the percentage of people from the unemployed who were eligible participated actually in the job? So, uh, I'm trying to recall the exact number, I think we have about like 48 out of 64 in, of the initial wave. And then there's more long term unemployed who we can edit later. Um, and the ones were not again linked to people like in hospital and stuff. Yeah. Um, so this is the other part that's not tautological, right? Which is the short term unemployed who are not eligible. Yeah. Here we that was not a question about spillover effects, whether this is just like when right, the extreme you might think it's not creating any jobs, it's just yeah. substituting for market jobs. Yeah. Then you would have uh, in that case, uh, I mean it's not an impossible result theoretically, right? Then you might have had zero expect zero effect on total unemployment. I think it would be an extreme case. It's really not possible, right? So total unemployment is going down quite a bit. Um, and different again is like the, this this um, slight increase in short term unemployment. Um, yeah, which is a bit unclear what to make of given the fluctuations that you already seen before the program starts. But at least the point estimate is like a little bit of an increase in short term unemployment. And so here's the permutation inference that is promised for that. Right, so recall what this is doing is we're taking these 26 municipalities that look similar to covered noiseville. And for each of them, we're running the same estimation approach. For each of them, we're constructing a synthetic control in turn and estimating the, the hypothetical effect of the program, if you want. And then we're plotting the effect on um, the, the, the estimated treatment effect for, for each of them. And so, to the extent that the red line is an outlier and the gray lines, then it suggests you have a significant result, um, which is very clearly is the case for the long term unemployment, right? So, we essentially end up at the bottom of the pile. Um, it's, here, it's, it's a little bit less clear. You get like, I think, four out of, or four or five out of the 26 um, have stronger reduction in unemployment, but that also starts quite a bit before the program starts. And similarly for for the increase in, in short term unemployment, right? It seems a little bit above average, but not outliers. So it's hard to what to say about that given given the sample size that we have, but yeah, that's what we got. Um, and then the last comparison that I promised you is um, to control for individuals. Right, so here, and that, that has a number of advantages. One is here, again, we don't have these anticipation and spillover effects on them. 
On the other hand, we can also look at these longer term outcomes because the experimental comparison disappears after April 22. Um, and so you essentially see like very similar results for, for the control town individuals, which are the blue circles relative to the control group individuals, which are the gray triangles. Um, and then these, these effects persist if you look in subsequent years for the economic outcomes. Um, here you see the same for these non-economic outcomes. But there again, the, the red-gray comparison is actually the same I showed you before for the experimental comparison. And now I've, I've overlaid on top of that the control counts, which again suggests some positive anticipation effects in the initial period. Um, and by and large, uh, this effect, the size of these effects persists in some subsequent years. So it's not just an initial clip that then disappears. It seems these are kind of um, at least while the program is ongoing, that these effects are, are still there. Um, all right. So let me now summarize and then conclude with a, like a brief comparison between what we're doing here and the original marine type study, which has been this also uh, in a way interesting from a like history of science perspective, if you want to think about how sort of science developed over the last century. Um, what are we doing? So this is kind of summarizing the ideas behind our study design. We, we do this matched random assignment, right, rather than just pure randomization or to increase the precision of estimates to get the standard errors down if you want. We do this staggered rollout, which allows us to get anticipation effects. We do this synthetic control comparison at the municipality level to get at these um, spillover or equilibrium effects on non-individual non individuals. We are also looking at these control town individuals to estimate long-term effects right after we don't have experimental comparison anymore. We're using a pre-registered design, both for the experimental comparison and for the synthetic control to kind of tie our hands, right? We said beforehand what we're going to report before we collected any data. And we're using randomization inference, which is a way of, of getting p-values that are exactly valid in plugin samples without any symptomatic approximations. Substance and profitability or anything like that. Um, again, just to, to recap the findings one more time, um, we get this positive effect, individual level effects on economic and social well being, so income, income security, and employment, which are kind of the, the less surprising ones, but then also on exactly the variables that the sociologists have been emphasizing, such as time structure, activity, social contacts, collective purpose, and status. Um, don't find effects in physical health and economic preferences, particular time risk, preferences, reciprocity, altruism, and trust, at least within again, the time frame of the experimental comparison. Um, we find mostly similar effects in the control town individual comparison, although slightly is um, slightly larger um, control town comparison, which suggests some anticipation effects, some positive anticipation effects. We find persistence of these effects in the sense that the magnitude is uh, more or less the same in subsequent years. And we find this overall large reduction of the level unemployment, which kind of corresponds to near elimination of long term unemployment and a small increase short term. And just to conclude, um, just kind of a bit of an aside here. Again, I think um, interesting. If you compare, I, I know, when writing this paper, I went back and reread the, the whole study, um, which is in many ways kind of an amazing piece of work and obviously it's been quite influential. Um, but in doing so, it was also striking to see how different it is uh, from, from how social science papers are written these days. And I kind of would think of what we are doing here is somewhat typical of, of kind of a modern program evaluation. And we obviously try to be, to be careful, but not doing anything um, extraordinary here in some sense. <laughs> and so I tried to contrast uh, with the, the approaches of what they were doing and what we we're doing here kind of a century later. And the first thing is kind of what's, what's the overall emphasis, which is in the old study, the primary goal is classification, right? So essentially what they're doing is they're collecting all this evidence, um, all kinds of different sources, and then classifying the unemployed into ideal types um, who, who might have different types of reactions to, to unemployment. 
where is an hour paper like in much of uh, program evaluation of recent decades that primarily focuses on um, causality, right? So it's asking what's the causal impact of the program on the participants. And I think we will hear what they were saying with unemployment or employment. And so corresponding to this different focus, right? In the old study, there's no such thing as a control group. Like in a way, everybody is, is treated in some sense, right? Which yeah, yeah, you don't need a control group if you don't want to make causal statements. Um, the study, in a sense, is sort of macro event, right? The, the Great Depression and how it impacted people. Um, for which, in a way, there is no outside, right? Or as anybody was affected by the Great Depression. By contrast, we are interested in, in some sort of call it micro policy intervention, substance that impacts people at the individual level or at the municipality level. Um, but what they are doing is, in some sense, that they are extremely rich in terms of the evidence that they're collecting, right? So it's everything from children's school essays to observing how fast people walk on the streets to, to hanging around in people's kitchens and talking to them and, and just many, many different things. And in a way, they're trying to capture all the heterogeneity. There's, whereas if you think about what kind of causal inference methods try to do is, in some sense, to balance out all the heterogeneity. But make in some sense treatment and control groups as similar to each other as possible, um, in a way that um, so that when, when you take a difference, that the difference is really um, due to the treatment rather than to something else. Right. So in a way that causal inference is all just about balancing conversion AD. So that, I mean, I see the difference here with you study, but that's not a general point, right? Because usually if your sample would have been larger, you would have been very interested, I guess, into heterogeneous uh, treatment effects and things like that. So yeah, but there's still, there would still be the assumption there's unobserved heterogeneity, right? So we don't think, I mean, that's kind of called controlling for observables thing, right? Is it enough to, to make causal inference? And only if, if there's no unobserved heterogeneity or self-selection, by them all, if you think about like what all um, experimental or quasi-experimental methods try to do is exactly make the unobserved version uh, the same. Um, so a second slightly different point here is there's no such thing as uncertainty quantification in the original study. They have fair amount of quantitative work in there actually, but there's no such thing as a standard error or a p-value or a confidence interval or anything like that. Um, and in a way, one, one way to think about that is that for them, really, the estimate is the estimate, right? There, there is no, no sense, like a superpopulation that they're trying to learn something about. They're talking about the people that they observe, and that's it. Whereas the way what we're doing here, again, the textbook statistics, if you want, if you think of this as a sample from some, some hypothetical or really superpopulation. And so once we have this distinction between the sample and the population that we're interested in, then we can start talking about something like standard errors or confidence intervals. And the third point is they're extremely methodologically open-ended, right? Which is kind of impressive in some sense. They, they just went into this town. They had no idea what to expect. They didn't know what they were going to do. And they just started talking to people, um, writing down things, collecting evidence, whatever they could get their, their hands on, essentially. Um, which gives us like a really rich picture of what's going on. Uh, in a way, we are again at, at the opposite extreme. We have totally pre-registered before we see any data. We, we decide what we are doing with, uh, with it as kind of a way of, of tying our hands and avoiding any cherry picking, but also maybe a, uh, as a consequence, like um, not giving us any, any chance of being surprised in the same way. Um, yeah. And yeah, lastly, I guess the last connection or, or arc you want to emphasize is again, yeah, how the both in this original study and for decades afterwards in her work emphasized all these non-monetary benefits and aspects of employment, which then more recent sociologists have quantified in the survey batteries, which we included just some curiosity in our, our study. And that's again verifying the largest effect of, of the employment guarantee, which I found quite intriguing. That's what I have for you. Just a